Hello and welcome to The Mushroom Show. This is the place where you get a front seat to the mushroom revolution that's happening right now. And I'm super excited because today we are speaking with Andrew Carter. He is the co-founder of something called Small Hold. And if you've never heard of Small Hold before, it is a system of distributed mushroom farming systems. Plus they have their own mushroom farms where they sell fresh specialty exotic mushrooms like all different types of oysters, lion's mane. But what's really cool too is this distributed system where they are allowed allowing people to grow mushrooms at grocery stores or at restaurants so that they can be as fresh as they could be. It's called distributed agriculture and it's a really cool, unique idea. Andrew, again, is the co-founder. He really understands this stuff and you can tell he's really got a passion for all things mushrooms. So we talk about mushroom farming. We talk about the importance of local food and high quality mushrooms. We talk about the future for small hold and what they're trying to do in the mushroom space. And of course, we're talking about how crazy everything is right now in mushrooms and how much this space is really evolving. So I think you're going to love this conversation with Andrew Carter. Super in-depth, super interesting, and I hope you enjoy it. Again, there's links in the description below if you want to jump to any section of the interview. We also have links to uh, everywhere where you can go learn more about Small Hold if you like. So let's just dive right into the interview with Andrew Carter. Andrew Carter from Small Hold, thank you so much for joining us here on The Mushroom Show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Awesome. Super excited to chat. Now, we actually did have a chat almost three years ago now. Um, a lot has changed in the world, obviously. A lot has also changed in the world of mushrooms. But I think it makes sense still to go right back to the beginning. Remember in the last one, you said you originally kind of got into this idea of mushroom farming and, and, and general kind of, you know, growing plants through hydroponics and through lettuce and, you know, earthy greens and stuff like that. But I'd love to know kind of the origin story for, for you, for Andrew, how you got interested in mushrooms and how that led to the creation of what you're doing today, which is small hold. Yeah, it's been quite an adventure. Um, I, I grew up in California in Los Angeles, uh, not close to farms, but I was very interested in, in science and, um, ended up going to school in Vermont and tried to get, I tried to get as far away from Los Angeles as humanly possible as, as any uh, high schooler would try to do and found my way to Vermont and got the opportunity to study uh, environmental sciences and ecological design, uh, mainly with a person named Professor John Todd, um, who's an amazing ecologist that worked on a lot of uh, bioremediation technology. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically using plants and technology, usually submerged in water, not a lot of soil to filter out wastewater, um, kind of like modified aquaponic systems, uh, really cool stuff. It was so exciting. Mycelium running also came out like while I was in college. And so that was, you know, it on everyone's mind because we're all trying to figure out how to, you know, fix oil spills and stuff. And, um, I got out of school and couldn't find any work doing that, uh, <laughs> as you could probably imagine, and uh, became an arborist for a little while in LA and ended up moving out to New York and kind of was at the right place at the right time. A lot of people were starting to build big hydroponic facilities, like commercial slash local farming was becoming a really big thing and um, got to help a bunch of people build a bunch of companies over the last you know 10 or 15 years now. Um, I'm usually the technical person, so I would be called in to help you with your irrigation, labor management, how to build a greenhouse. I don't know. There's a million things that I could help you with. Um, but eventually that turned into helping people with their business plans. Like a lot of people were raising a lot of money in the indoor farming space, um, to grow leafy greens and herbs. And so they needed help figuring out how to make it make sense. Um, and I was always kind of pushing people to look outside of lettuce, um, even though that's like my main experience is growing lettuce um, and using all sorts of technology to do it. But then um, people just didn't really listen to me that much. And so I just decided to start playing around with growing mushrooms in the basement a lot, like how most a lot of mushroom farmers do, especially specialty growers. Um, eventually that grew into a shipping container farm in Williamsburg. Um, in Brooklyn. And then eventually that grew into the company that we have today. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happened in between, but, but that's, that's how we got here. Yeah. I mean, that's, 
super interesting. A lot of people do, you know, start growing these kind of specialty mushrooms on a very small scale because it's not something to see it on a big scale, right? You said you're doing this in New York. So not too far from there is Pennsylvania, which is kind of the, you know, the central hub yeah. for agaricus or button mushroom growing. But it seems like, you know, the kind of mushrooms that you're growing today are kind of the more exotic varieties. I mean, we don't consider them exotic, but a lot of people who don't know too much about mushrooms might consider them exotic. Do you feel like being particularly in Brooklyn had, uh, you know, because obviously there's a lot of restaurants nearby. It's not like you're in the middle of nowhere and people were a lot more open to these different kinds of crazy mushrooms. Yeah, that definitely helped. It was definitely, you know, we were in Brooklyn. There were people floating around at different restaurants and we're kind of part of that scene anyway. I have I've never worked at a restaurant, but I've worked in different food service before. Um, but a lot of our friends are in that space. And so it was really organic for us to start selling into trendy restaurants that were in the area. Um, back in, we started officially in 2017, but 2016 was kind of when we were doing the shipping containers. And that, um, that was, the mushroom stuff was just starting, you know? I mean, mushrooms have been around, but obviously, but like the what we're seeing right now, I feel like it's just, that was when it was sort of the early stages of this. Um, and even though the big, there's, I mean, there's also big specialty growers in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, a lot of these button growers have figured out how to do this on certain scales. And they still, in my opinion, struggle a little bit with supply chain and last mile delivery and all the stuff that makes it hard to deliver into a city. Mm -hmm. And so even though it's not that far away, um, we still have a quality advantage and an experience advantage, and we care so much about our products that I think the the experience of our mushrooms is is different than with a lot of the larger growers that are out there. Yeah, so let's dig into that a little bit because I think that's one of the coolest things about Smallhold. And I remember when I first saw it a number of years ago, I was just like, "This is this is perfect for mushrooms." Because as you mentioned, you know, mushrooms, especially the, the specialty varieties, like take an oyster for example. One of the things it suffers from is not a great shelf life. You know, if you're shipping oyster mushrooms across the country, by the time you get them, they're not going to look super high quality and it really doesn't do the mushroom justice. And what I think is cool about Smallhold is, yeah, so you were starting these shipping containers and, and selling locally to restaurants, which is, you know, really shortening that uh, distance and shortening the shelf life requirement. But um, let's talk a little bit or dig in a little bit about Smallhold, which is kind of this idea of distributed agriculture. So when I was in... New York, for example, I was in the Whole Foods and I saw this, what looked like a refrigerator, but the mushrooms were growing inside. And if you wanted to buy them, you know, you could literally have someone harvest them off the block and give them to you. So tell me a little bit the, about the evolution from this idea of shipping containers to the idea of distributed agriculture, why you went that way and a little bit of the technology behind it. Yeah. So it was always the idea that we would do we develop kind of this baseline technology, which is this hardware software solution? There's a lot of data we're collecting, but it's essentially like really intense climate management. Like there's other ways that we manage our teams. We have big facilities now too. So there's labor management and, you know, uh, managing our supply chain. But like the big thing that we really tried to focus on was advanced climate management because what we wanted, we couldn't really truly find on the market. And so we developed it for these small units that you find inside. We put in the shipping container originally, but now it's in these installations that you can find in Whole Foods Guanas, but also in Central Markets in Texas, and we're installing those all over the place. Um, but then also now in these larger facilities that we're building in for more regional hubs. And so um, the what I think there's there's stuff that exists, like you know I the people grow mushrooms. And so obviously we didn't invent growing specialty mushrooms or anything like that. Um, but what I do think needed to happen was to make, to bring farmer's market quality food to a large amount of people at the protocol and the requirements that large retailers require. You need to have kind of a mix of large scale um, with your buying power and some of your management, but then also you need to still be local and it doesn't make sense to go build a huge farm in Austin, for example, or in Brooklyn. It makes sense to build what makes sense for Brooklyn or what makes sense for Texas or what makes sense for Los Angeles. Um, and so all those things together have made us create this distributed network of farms 
um, which are these small installations or these larger facilities. You know, we also sell grow kits like that in a way is kind of part of this distributed network. We're like kind of growing some mushrooms in people's homes. It's not a core part of our business, but um, it's it's definitely part of it. Um, but we we also think that one of the, when we think about local or we think about fresh, a lot of it has to do with how close it is to the consumer. Um, and it's allowed us to grow really interesting varieties that people don't really see because people are trying to ship it across the country. It allows us to pack in compostable cardboard clamshells, which is really hard to use if you're shipping it from across the country. Like it's not possible, which is why people are using styrofoam and plastic. Um, and it it's like, it, it's weirdly constraining, but it feels like it's also kind of freeing because we can kind of be a little, have a little more wiggle room with a region rather than trying to look at the entire country as one big food system. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. And again, that's very, it's very mushroom like yeah. to have small little points of distribution everywhere. And, uh, with the idea of eventually it will all be connected in, in a great network. So I do like, you know, the kind of meta way to look at that. So, so last time I talked to you, you guys were in Brooklyn based out of New York. So now you're saying you also have a facility in, you said Austin, Texas. Yeah. So we have, um, we have a, we have a, a a few things going on in Brooklyn. That's where we're headquartered. And so I'm in Brooklyn right now. Um, okay. And we have a farm in Brooklyn near the Navy Yards. And then we have offices there. And then we have an R&D facility in South Austin. And then we have a larger facility in Buda, which is 20 minutes south of Austin. Um, and the larger facility is about 30,000 square feet, um, growing mushrooms that are sold in Central Market, Safeway, Whole Foods, HEB, uh, Misfits Markets, a bunch of different uh, food retailers and distributors in Texas. Um, Very cool. And now we're building out Los Angeles now, um, east of LA in Vernon, uh, to, to bring local mushrooms to the Southwest market. Oh, that's so cool. Continuing to spread. You mentioned, so you mentioned a, a R and D facility in, in Austin. What is it that you're researching and developing? Can you talk about any of that, that stuff that you're working on? Yeah, of course. Yeah. All sorts of stuff. Um, we're always, I mean, there's, with farming, you know, there's, there's testing new varieties, which is really the fun stuff and trying out different mushrooms and seeing if we could, how we can grow them, if our systems can handle growing them and if we could do it efficiently is one big part of it. But then also if, uh, it's efficient for us to be harvesting them, how we manage harvesting them, we have to like create all these operating procedures that are then rolled out at our large facilities. It doesn't make sense to go and just like, tell a whole team to just grow a mushroom and then expect it to be okay in a week. And so, right. you know, there's a lot of work that goes into managing how we explain the operation to the larger facilities. Um, and so it's like operating procedures, R and D. Then we also do a lot of equipment testing, like, like we're continuing to develop our own control systems. And so the latest generations of all of our control systems are installed in that space. And we're just always testing different, you know, ways of managing air in our, in our units. Cause that seems to be one of the, the bigger elements in, in this kind of an operation. Right. Because yeah, mushroom growing can be complicated, but I guess you're trying to simplify the whole process, right? So somebody at a restaurant or at a grocery store can have this unit, they get the fruiting blocks, which are kind of like a, a mushroom grow kit on a commercial scale, cut it open, put it in their box that looks cool and the mushrooms will grow. Um, so tell me a little bit about the technology and what it takes to create these perfect mushroom growing environments and what are the challenges, uh, if any, with people that, um, you know, basically allowing people to be mushroom farmers from anywhere without really the skills that it takes to be a mushroom farmer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, mushrooms are Mushrooms are, I mean, it's a whole different kingdom, right? So they're not like plants, they're not like animals, but there's certain aspects that are similar to farming anything where you could grow some oyster mushrooms on your counter and you spray them and you can grow some mushrooms yourself. There's a huge community of people who know how to grow mushrooms on their own. But then once you want to do it weekly with a really high fill density and making sure that you're growing like as much as possible in these spaces with like low amounts of contamination and following organic practices that's in large facilities or small facilities, like the little mini farms. Um, 
it takes a lot of work, in my opinion, like a lot of technology or and or a lot of labor. Um, and so what we developed were these computer systems, essentially. It's like our own PCB that can control um, all of the climate parameters. And so the, you know, there's basic stuff like your temperature and your humidity and your CO2 levels, but then managing all of that in a really complicated way has been a huge hassle, basically. Um, the one thing that I've noticed as I visited tons of other farms is that it gets a lot easier when you're at a larger grow chamber size. Like mm -hmm. it, weirdly, a larger space is way easier to manage. And we've figured out ways of growing it in really tiny spaces, um, which your mushrooms are dealing with tons of like CO2 constriction and humidity is hard to manage. Um, dehumidification is impossible to manage. All this stuff ends up requiring a lot of work, which is what we've been really developing over the years. Um, yeah. And I guess and so just to add some... go into like, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I, I cut you off there. I know. I was just saying, if you go into any of these, if you go into like Whole Foods and Guanas or in Central Market in Texas or Standard Hotels in East Village or something, you'll see these units there. And we try to make it fairly easy for our customers. Like we, most customers we're servicing, like they, they contract us to service these units. And so we'll bring them substrate, but we'll also help them harvest. We'll do a cleaning, like all these farms are certified organic. So we, we certify like through NOFA, um, the, the little farms that you find. In, oh, like, wow. I didn't know that. And That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the, the, uh, you know, there, there's, we help a lot and people, you know, that's kind of part of our service and what we do with those. We have some retailers like in Central Market, for example, where they've taken on a lot of the work. They have, if you're not familiar with the grocery store, it's an amazing grocery store. It's like a food wonderland. They have just, they, they were like anti-packaging before COVID. Now they have like certain rules, but I'm just all about what they do there. But their mushroom section is insane. I mean, they have many farms, but it's just like a cornucopia of every mushroom you could possibly imagine. And um they uh, they have a whole team that will help with harvest and and all that kind of stuff, but they don't manage the climates. That's all done by us remotely. And so we're doing that all through the internet and making sure that everything is running correctly. Um, and if we have any issues, we can deal with most of it remotely. That's awesome. So it's like uh, mushroom farming, technical remote support kind of thing, which is really yeah, cool. Kind of, yeah. And I just want to add a little bit of context to people listening, if they it might not be familiar with the conditions. The reason why, I mean, mushrooms need a couple things, right? They need high humidity and lots of fresh air, which is kind of difficult to manage in a small space because typically if you have high humidity, well, then you're not bringing in a lot of fresh air. And if you're bringing in a lot of fresh air, then you don't have a lot of high humidity. And if mushrooms have a high CO2 environment, they look different, right? I mean, specifically oysters are something that are really difficult to grow in a high CO2 environment because they'll get long kind of, you know, stems, which aren't the best part of the mushrooms and these tiny little caps. And then vice versa, though, if it's too dry, they'll just abort or they won't grow at all. So like managing those things is really tricky. And I think in nature, obviously, it's a lot different because, you know, they just grow where the conditions are good. But if you're trying to force it into a small space, that can be uh, quite the challenge. And on that note, I wanted to ask you, of course, so, you know, you developed your mushroom mini farms all over the place, which are super cool. Um, there's a new product that is soon to be on the market called the Mela, and it's kind of like a consumer version of what you guys are trying to do. I want to know if you've, if you've seen the Mela, if you've used the Mela, what you think of it, and what are some of the specific challenges you might see with it? I haven't, I haven't, I mean, I've seen the videos of it. I haven't uh, used it yet. Um, you know, I think it's, we like very intentionally chose not to do a home technology piece of technology. Um, I like, I think grow kits are cool um, for people to, to enjoy, but I get, I do get worried about, um, about individuals failing of growing things. So mm -hmm. I have a, I have a story, I guess, years ago, I worked uh, at, we had a small team that made a product called window farms. It was like in 2010, we were one of the first Kickstarter projects and we made uh, hydroponic units out of water bottles. We had this really crazy forum with all these people uh, helping us do R and D eventually we made this home product that allowed people to grow uh, hydroponically in their windows. And you can Google window farms and find some images of it. It's pretty cool. Um, there was what killed me is like when you get someone 
who like the power went out or the plants died or something happened and they bought this piece of equipment and then they think that they can't grow something anymore because they failed. Right. That freaks me out. Like I just like the last thing I want to do is have people think that they're, they're like brown thumbs or whatever. And so like, I, I just, that, that's, that's why even getting into like doing, um, doing grow kits, kind of freaked me out a little bit but it feels like if we just do the right varieties that are fairly easy like blue blue oysters and lion's mane those are the ones we really do um then we know that you have a fairly good success rate um why i bring this up like the mela might be a way to increase your success rate but what i wouldn't want is for there to be a lot of failure and then people to like not think that this equipment works or think or like take blame and so i get a little worried about that if you're asking what i worry about but um, I think it's cool. I mean, I think bringing, bringing into people's homes and getting people to grow more mushrooms is great. I mean, we just want people to eat fresh mushrooms. And so if you can make it so it's fresher and, and more usable and easier to grow, then, then I'm all about it. Yeah. I mean, personally too, I just think it's a fun idea because yeah, obviously I'm an evangelist for, for people growing mushrooms because I get so much joy out of it, but it seems to be like, there's some barriers for people to be able to do it. Like, you know, everybody with a backyard is like, Oh, you know, I'll grow tomatoes or I'll grow peppers or whatever, do some gardening. And nobody really thinks of being able to grow mushrooms. Obviously that's changing. I think that's changed a lot more specifically in the last couple of years with all the cool work that, you know, everybody in the mushroom community is doing a lot more people are growing mushrooms, but I think the more things like mushroom grow kits, like the Mela that kind of like nudge people in the right direction. I mean, I like to imagine a world where, you know, growing mushrooms at home is as common as, as gardening. Um, yeah. Maybe that's, I don't know, maybe that's a little too, uh, unrealistic but who knows i think i think it's a really cool idea i think it's i think we're getting there i mean i we have this idea where and you're i imagine the people that watch this and listen to this are mushroom people um but there's a lot of people who aren't mushroom people and what i find with the grow kits what i love about it is if you give 10 people a grow kit i bet you like a quarter at least a quarter of those people will be like mushroom people for the rest of their lives like their (laughs) lives will change like they will watch your show they'll read all the books they'll get on the forums like go to the mycological society um hopefully buy some small hold mushrooms but like you know it's it's like completely changing people's lives and all their food products don't really do that like you know you get a sweet green bowl it's not like i mean some people maybe will buy salads for the rest of their life, but it's not the same as yep. with mushrooms. Um, and so I love the grow kits for that. I think that that's like, it's just really like evangelizes people and gets people so into the space. Um, yeah. So more the merrier. I also agree with that. Especially kids too, right? Like I think because it's so satisfying, like every morning, if you have an oyster mushroom grow kit or something or a bucket outside, like every morning you come downstairs and your mushrooms are twice as big and you're just like, ah, how did this happen? Like you can almost watch them grow and then you can harvest them and they'll grow again. And you're just like, wow, this is so cool. And it kind of leads you down a rabbit hole. Um, But I totally get where you're coming from too, in in terms of that hesitation. Cause like, for example, we used to sell grain spawn and you know, grain spawn is a great way for people to start growing mushrooms and you can grow mushrooms using various methods once you have the grain spawn, but it's not like simple and super easy and a lot of people can can mess it up. So I think like you got to find the balance between, because of course, if you see so get a mushroom grow kit and it doesn't work or you try to grow something that's a little difficult or whatever, then that can have the opposite effect, right? It can be like, ah, growing mushrooms is hard, stupid. I don't want to spend all this money. I'll just yeah. buy them at the store, um, which I guess luckily... You can buy it in the store I know, uh, yeah. nowadays, which is really yeah. cool too. So one of the things I noticed since the last time we talked was um, like the the little packages you guys have of these different specialty mushrooms, which people can now get in grocery stores. And I haven't been to Austin in probably a year and a half, but somebody did send me a picture of the little small hold uh, mushroom setup. And it, it just looks so cool, right? Like I think people walking by that would be like, oh, wow, like what is this? <clears throat> and get really interested in, in it. But like mushrooms seem to be one of those things where maybe in three or four years ago, it was just like, you just buy them in bulk. They were just, you know, they've never really been something that's been kind of branded. So I did want to talk about your thoughts behind that a little bit because yeah, the little small hold cardboard, it's beautifully branded. Like it looks super cool. 
Um, what were some of the thoughts behind that? And have you noticed a pretty good reception for people who are looking for those types of mushrooms? Yeah. I mean, the, the decision making process was very funny because it was kind of COVID driven right. where we were selling bulk and then we were selling into Whole Foods in the Northeast and uh, a lot of these produce buyers didn't want bulk food for a while because of the whole like COVID on surfaces thing that was going on in the beginning of the, the whole pandemic. Yep. Um, and that's kind of changed at this point, but the, the situation was still the same back then. They didn't really want to buy bulk. And so we also didn't want plastic or styrofoam because that's the easiest way to do this. Like there's whole systems to do this. It's cheaper. It's like, it's really easy breezy to wrap stuff in horrible materials. And, um, and we didn't want to do that. And so we, you know, did some our development, we found vendors, we did all sorts of stuff to make those packages happen. Um, it was fairly quick, like it was very reactive for us, but um, we do think a lot about how our brand stands out on the shelf, because I think there is a weird disconnect between the large scale mushroom industry and what's going on with consumer trends. Mm -hmm. And I say large scale because mm -hmm. most small, small growers aren't in grocery stores. Like we're not like in the same sort of zones, you know, we're, we're dealing with like big grocery store chains that are buying loose mushrooms that are like no name or buying button mushrooms basically that are packaged and every now and then some oysters and potentially some imports. Um, and so when we come in with a package with a brand that people will remember, um, it's, it like brightens up the aisle. And, um, I think a lot of people are really receptive of it. Um, branded produce is kind of this new thing in my opinion. Like, you know, there are large brands that people know like Chiquita or like mushroom people know like Phillips, you know, or Giorgio. Um, but they're not true brands and that people would really care about them. No offense, everyone, if you're <laughs> listening to this. Um, but I don't think consumers really like identify with any of these groups. Um, and there's new companies. I see it more in lettuce space because that's where I kind of came from. But like, you know, on the East Coast, we have Gotham Greens. We have these big vertical farms like Bowery and Aero Farms. These, these are, they're trying to turn these into household names. Yeah. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to do that in the mushroom space um, to get people excited about a brand. Um, how we think about the brand, though, is not just a brand because that doesn't have any staying power. Anyone can just name something or like find an ad group or something to make a name, um, which we didn't do. Um, <laughs> but the uh, they we think that by growing locally, like everyone gets paid a livable wage. We're always certified organic. Like we do all of the things that we care about and those all will feed into the brand. And then hopefully people, when they see this, the name small hold, they're like, oh yeah, this is, these are all these things that I care about. Um, and ideally it changes the whole industry. Like if the entire mushroom industry started packing in cardboard clamshells, it's like a weird situation for us, but I would love that because it's less styrofoam and plastic in the environment. Um, and so we think that just by like trying to change the game a little bit in these grocery stores, then hopefully we can push the industry in a different way um, and get people to expect a little more from, from the produce brands that are on the shelf. Yeah. And uh, people are paying a lot more attention to that these days as well. It's like, Oh, like where did these mushrooms come from or, you know, what, all that kind of stuff. So I, I just think that's really smart. And that's something that I thought was really obvious for a long time too it's like why isn't there a mushroom brand or like why isn't I know. <laughs> anybody taking this like obvious wide open opportunity so that's why when i saw small hold do it which, which is like a great brand like you said you didn't like work with an ad agency or anything to come up with that name but like it looks great and like the name is really cool and you know it it means what it says it means it's just um i think it's just a really cool opportunity so i'm um, i'm loving what i'm seeing there Thank you. um on that note though like what what are you guys working on now? What are you most excited about with what you're doing currently at Small Hold and what does the future hold? Yeah, um, we're working on all sorts of stuff. Uh, we are building out Los Angeles right now, which is very exciting. And so we'll be um, in a bunch of grocery stores and some restaurants uh, later this year. Um, certified organic commercial mushroom farm in LA, which is pretty cool. I mean, technically it's in Vernon, but it's like 10 minutes east of downtown LA. So it's very much part of the city. I grew up there. And so I have a, a specific excitement about it. Um, and so we're all hands on deck 
working on that and obviously continuing to grow into Texas and the Northeast. But that's like the big focus right now is getting the West Coast up and running. Um, you know, we want to build these things all over the place, um, not necessarily everywhere, but places that, you know, we think that it makes sense for us to be. Um, we're always looking for different farmers to partner with and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a funny situation to be in to like look at markets and try to like feel where local mushrooms need to be. But, um, you know, for us, it's all about like being clear with other mushroom growers and talking to people about where they want to be and where we should be and how we can kind of slot into the mushroom space. Um, because again, like what we're really trying to do is bring, fresh like farmer's market quality mushrooms to the grocery store and just kind of like take away a chunk of the button section and turn it into something a little more special. Um, and so beyond that, like working on a bunch of different crops to bring to the grocery store, like different varieties of mushrooms, no buttons. We don't do that. Um, the, right. uh, and working on, um, other kinds of products that might incorporate mushrooms. Um, you know, and I can't get too far into it, but we're working on a, a few different, a few different things that are pretty exciting. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, you're starting to see mushrooms, uh, in all sorts of different form factors, obviously, but like one of the, one of the obvious ones is like mushroom jerky or like sure. mushrooms as a meat replacement, which a lot of people are doing, um, which is really, really cool. I mean, there's some mushroom jerkies that are just absolutely delicious and it's almost like using a waste stream yeah. from agaricus or some other types of mushrooms that you can use in all sorts of really smart and interesting ways. You talked about the different species. I do want to dig into that a little bit. So um, you guys do like oysters. I've seen like pink oysters and the blue oysters and king oysters. Um, what other types of mushrooms are you growing? And is there any ones that have some very specific challenges that you're trying to work through? Yeah. I mean, all of them have their, their challenges. We, I mean, we grow all the oysters, all the colors, and then the trumpets or the king oysters. And then we do a lot of lion's mane, um, we do maitake and shiitake. Um, they all have really funny things mm -hmm. like the, uh, blue oysters are probably the easiest, but if the climate isn't managed correctly, which happens even with all of the technology that we have, you know, we're farm, you know, I, I, I'm happy to admit that, um, the, uh, you get random issues, you know, um, I'm always, I'm always concerned about bacterial blotch. Like we don't get it very much and none of that stuff goes out to our customers, but it's a big, uh, it always freaks us out. Like it's, it's the scary unknown for us. Um, then with lion's mane, we're pretty good at growing. My take takes a long time. And so that's a struggle. Mm -hmm. Shiitake market fluctuates a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever spoken about the whole uh, Chinese substrate situation um, with the shiitake market, um, which we didn't want to grow it for a while, but then it seems like the prices are going up a little bit because of the supply chain issues with all of the containers and people are starting to produce shiitake domestically again mm -hmm. um, and like doing substrates domestically. And so the prices make sense now. And so we're starting to do that. Um, it's, it's like every mushroom has their own thing, you know, and it's, and, it, and I don't, you know, I wouldn't say that any of it has to do with one particular element of our farm. Um, but I guess the, the one thing that we're always trying to battle with is like, is, is labor management. You know, we, you know, are, are hand harvesting these mushrooms. And so, um, you know, making a product that's consistent, that is the right size. There's a lot of kind of like, decision-making that goes on when someone's like, this is a pretty mushroom and this goes in the box. And some people are like, no, this goes in the bulk bin. And um, there's always a lot of work to be done on making that more efficient and easier for our team to manage. Um, but and that's across all varieties. That's always something that we're continuing to work on. Yeah. I guess like at the end of the day, mushroom farming, no matter how you do it, is still farming, right? And there's the ups and downs. This is the managing the markets. This is the difficulty. Mushrooms probably aren't always super cooperative. You know, they're this natural organism that we're trying to force to do a very specific thing in a very specific time and place. Um, so there's there's the same challenges I'm sure that you experience with farming, but you're just doing it at a much wider, more distributed scale. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Well, yeah, I, I think what what you guys are doing at Smallhold is just it's so cool. Um, 
I've loved watching it evolve over the years, um, watching you guys continuously expand. Have you noticed, we've noticed for sure at Fresh Cap, like the last, call it two years, there's been an exponential growth in interest and awareness in mushrooms of all types. Have you noticed the same thing? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Smallhold was like a team of 12, I think, when COVID started. And we're almost 100 people now with farms all over the place. It's like, wow, I did um, not realize that. It's crazy. And so, you know, it's a lot of people are farming, you know, they have like big yeah. operations. And so, and then there's part time and full time. And so, you know, it's not like, I mean, it's it's big. We're, we're becoming a pretty big operation, in our opinion, like comparatively to where we were uh, before COVID. And I think everyone has their own theory about it. I think I think that mushrooms are kind of like in the middle of a bunch of different trends. Mm -hmm. um, mushrooms were starting to trend anyway. And I think that like whether COVID or happened or not, I think that like American consumers were becoming more experimental with their diets. Um, you can see this with like other food trends, like, you know, all the fermented foods are really trendy and like, any sort of uh, food that's not American is becoming more accepted by, you know, your typical American. And so that was probably going to lead people into the mushroom section anyway, and looking for some variety in that section, because, you know, there's a lot more than buttons. But I do think that COVID, like, drove a lot of people to grocery stores, uh, which just, like, sped that whole entire process up. And you know, there's people, there's statistics out there that like the mushroom market spiked to like 130% over what it was pre-COVID. And then it settled to like 40 or 50% the demand that it was before COVID. Um, whole produce section saw a big bump, like every produce grower, if you were at the right place at the right time, saw like a really big uh, bump in sales. But mushrooms led the pack, like by far was, was had the, had the most growth. Like it's obviously a smaller market than a lot of these, than like bananas or something like that. But, right. um, saw, saw a big bump, um, at this. And I think like, there's just people going to the grocery store. There's people trying to be healthy. There's people trying to be vegetarian and vegan. I think that like impossible and beyond there's, they're doing important work, but like that to me is just a stepping stone. Like if you take it to its logical conclusion, like is the whole world going to be eating impossible burgers every night if everyone's vegan? Like, no, like that's crazy. It's expensive. And like, hopefully they make them healthier. I'd imagine they will, but it's not very healthy. And so right. you like, I think it's important for them to do that, but like what will happen if we actually change people's diets, hopefully the world will change a little bit then they'll have to have more food that's more meat-like, which then in turn will bring people to the mushroom section. Um, and I'm just kind of listing stuff off, but I think Fantastic Fungi really did change the game for a lot of people. Yeah. And so like, it's like not giving them credit for like completely shifting the mushroom mentality in the United States is absolutely not fair because they definitely did that. Um, like everyone I know, like, you know, our landlord, has watched fantastic fungi and like is obsessed with it. And so it's like, yep. you know, it, I, I think that, um, that, that made so many people mushroom people and they're just looking for it in everything. Cause you can put it in almost anything, you know, people are putting in their coffee, people are putting in their meals, people are wearing, wearing it on their clothes. Like it, it has like the fungal community has so much of a opportunity. I, I question if it needs to be in everything, but like, you know, it, it, there's, I think it's so exciting for so many people because there's not a whole lot of things that are quite like that on our planet. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's something that like, yeah, maybe like mushroom people like you and me or a lot of people watching the channel, like it's something we knew for a long time. It's like, look, we should all be super excited about mushrooms because they are able to be part of like so many different aspects of life planet and you talked about like mushroom materials and we talk about um you know mushroom is a meat replacement medicinal mushrooms for for health people growing mushrooms at home and it seems like there's all of these tailwinds and everything seems to be kind of coming together at once and again it's it's very meta because it's like all of these different seeds are kind of a distributed system that's all kind of coming together and when it finally all connects it turns into this one beautiful thing which is a mushroom and i think you're right fantastic fungi it was a massive 
accelerator of everything, but it was all happening anyway. And that's why the documentary, you know, came about. Like they, they were working on that for probably, I don't know, eight years or something. Yeah. But it wasn't until it hit Netflix that all of a sudden, you know, tens of millions of people across North America were like, wow, mushrooms are actually really cool. Yeah. And then it was just like, I know, <laughs> we've been telling you this. So it was really cool to see. But I'm of the opinion too that we're still just kind of getting started. I think um, you know, mushrooms are going to continue to trend. More things are going to continue to happen. More people are going to be fascinated by fungi, fascinated by the fifth kingdom. And I'm really excited to see uh, where it's all going to go. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you, you see U.S. consumption of mushrooms is tiny. It's like two to three pounds per person per year or something like that. And it's estimated that um, in China, you know, people are eating you know, 15 to 25 pounds per person per year. Um, and it's not that you'd expect a, the U S to quite that's so cultural. And so it's like, you couldn't expect us to get there, but going and doubling or even tripling our consumption is totally within reach. And there's not a lot of produce categories that are quite like that. Like that you could expect some like consumers to eat twice as much lettuce or twice as much strawberries. Um, right. but mushrooms definitely have a lot of room to grow in, in the United States at least. Yeah. And I think it, that's important that you brought up that cultural aspect. Cause you're right. And I've, you know, I've been to certain parts of China and like, there is a lot of mushrooms and mushrooms are in every meal. Some, some meals are only mushrooms yeah. I've seen. Um, but again, you know, that cultural shift I do think is happening and it might play out over 10, 15, 20 years, but you're right. I think there's a very long runway for mushrooms. I think there's a very long runway for everything that you guys are doing at small hold. Um, is there anything else uh, you wanted to to let people know who are listening who might be interested in mushrooms? Uh, let us know where they could learn more about Small Hold and everything that you're doing. Yeah, I mean, check us out online. If you Google Small Hold or you know Small Hold mushrooms, you'll probably find us. But we're at smallhold.com and on Instagram and all of that. Um, we have a newsletter that goes out monthly with a bunch of different mushroom news and usually a bunch of rants from myself or my co-founder um, and mushroom rants generally. <laughs> um, but uh, there's a lot of mushroom news there and a lot of information. Um, and then just try to eat more mushrooms. Like I'd love for you to eat small hold mushrooms, but it doesn't have to be. Go to your farmer's market, go to your grocery store. I know we, we talk a lot of smack about button mushrooms, but that's okay too. But mushrooms are amazing mushroom. Um, and so uh, please just try to incorporate it more in your diet and um, and hopefully, you know, uh, it'll it'll help change change our our planet and our society. Awesome! So you heard it here first. Eat more mushrooms, everybody. So yeah. <laughs> we will put the links to Small Hold and everything else in the description of this video. So go down and check that out if you want. And again, thank you so much, Andrew, for being on the show. It was awesome to chat with you. And congrats on all your success uh, with everything going on over at Small Hold. Thank you. You too. Awesome.